news about the Great Waters, Great Waters Group, but let me tell you just a bit about us for those who don't. Uh, we're one of the biggest, like maybe we are the biggest group, uh, a Sierra Club group in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, we represent the four counties of Milwaukee, Ozaki, uh, <clears throat> Waukesha, and um, Washington. So everybody who's a member of the Sierra Club in those four counties is a member of the Great Waters Group. So we welcome all. And if any of you are interested in joining us uh, as volunteers on various activities um, in the coming year and or to plan those, we'd certainly welcome you and we could chat afterwards uh, with Jenny, our chair, or Karen, or, or, or David, or others as well. Um, today, it is my distinct pleasure to uh, introduce to you our speaker for the evening, Cheryl Nin, and she will be speaking on contamination and restoration of Milwaukee's rivers. Uh, Cheryl will, um, <clears throat> We'll be speaking about the history of the Milwaukee River Basin, including its legacy of pollution and habitat destruction, the current state of the Milwaukee, uh, Menominee and Kinnikinick Rivers, and work done to protect and restore the rivers so that they can be used safely and enjoyed by everyone in the community or anyone who comes into our community. Cheryl then is a resident of Milwaukee and has been river keeper at Milwaukee River Keeper for almost 19 years, during which time she's been very busy, as you'll see in a moment, in her ongoing role in, the monitor, in monitoring the health and providing scientific data of the Milwaukee River Basin. She continued to be a persistent and trusted voice in educated, educating the public about the water we all rely on for our lives. As the Milwaukee Riverkeeper, she patrols local waterways, identifies problems in the Milwaukee River Basin, responds to citizen concerns, reviews permits, and helps these collaborative solution, find collaborative solutions to problems affecting local rivers. And as well, takes her evenings off and presents to a group like ours uh, this evening. Ms. Nin is a, has a Bachelor of Science degree in biology from the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana and a master's degree in natural resource Ecology and Management from the University of Michigan School of Natural Resources and Environment. I introduce and present to you, Cheryl. Great, you, Cheryl. Thank, you. thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Um, and I know many of you, so lovely to see so many of you, friends. All right, so are you guys seeing my screen? Yes. And everyone can hear fine. Uh, so far, it's dark. Oh, there we go. Are you seeing it now? Okay. Yeah. Great. I also will just say um, I've been having some internet kind of weirdness, like instability. So if I break up or something, feel free to to jump in and tell me you you miss what I said or or something. Um, well, I guess I'll just get going. Thanks so much for having me. I'm going to talk a little bit today about um, the Milwaukee River Basin, and I, I've done a lot of talks, and I think even to Sierra Club before. Let me go to my slideshow here, and um, I um, this one's going to I think focus a little bit more on um, kind of the the restoration work that that's happening. Let me see. Oops, sorry, give me a second here. Trying to start the slideshow here. Hold on just a second. Okay. 
So everyone should be able to see it now, hopefully. Sorry about that. Little technical issues here. Okay, so um, we'll talk a little bit today about the legacy of um, legacy pollution that's affected the watershed and some of the history, and then just start talking a little bit about restoration. And I'm happy to, if folks wanna um, pop in with some questions, that's fine, or we can also wait till the end. Um, so I think most folks here, certainly as part of Sierra Club, uh, have heard of Riverkeeper before. Um, our mission is to protect, improve, and advocate for water quality, um, riparian wildlife habitat, and sound land management in the Milwaukee, Menominee, Knickknick River watersheds. Um, so that's about a 900 square mile area. That's essentially all of the land that drains to the Milwaukee River and its tributaries. Um, and so these are just some different buckets of work of what we do. Um, we do a lot of water quality monitoring, and I'll just talk a little tiny bit about that today. Um, we do a lot of uh, paddle events and just connecting people to the river. Um, we do cleanup events. Uh, we, we patrol, we do education, and a lot of advocacy as well, which is the big part of my job. So we're Milwaukee Riverkeeper, and what that means is that we are part of a group called Waterkeeper Alliance. We each have our own individual organizations and, and you know, independent uh, fundraising and, and all of that, but we essentially work together to find uh, more efficient and effective ways of protecting the water. So we currently have about 340 different water keepers in 47 different countries that um, are licensed to use the family of names, so river keeper, bay keeper, water keeper, and we're all independent watchdogs for our own waterways. Um, and as, as Bill mentioned, we respond to citizen concerns and complaints um, and find solutions to environmental problems. And that's something certainly that we do in collaboration with many other NGOs and government organizations, landowners, um, and friends. Um, and we also have a boat, so we do physically patrol the river and we do conduct proactive monitoring um, and patrols and are out on the water as much as we can be. So the, the first Milwaukeeans, um, you know, this is just kind of a slide to, uh, you know, show that obviously I'm gonna be talking a lot about what white people, <laughs> what we, you know, did to the river systems when we, we moved here, but obviously there's been people living here for thousands, if not tens of thousands of years. Um, and this is just a list of some of, of those folks. And, you know, we are, our three rivers are all Algonquin names. Um, you know, Menominee is kind of the, the place where the wild rice grows, which is uh, where Menominee came from. Um, Milioke um, is, um, you know, largely known as the good land um, or gathering place by the waters, which is obviously the name for the Milwaukee. And then Kinnikinnik, um, my understanding is like a ceremonial tobacco mixture um, that's used by, um, by Native Americans, but that's where Knick Knick came from. So this is just a really early um, kind of rendering here of Milwaukee um, and probably, you know, what it might have looked like when, when first the white settlers came in around um, 1835. So I like this map because it's very water focused and you don't often see maps of Milwaukee that are kind of like bam from the water. <laughs> um, but it has Lake Michigan in the foreground, and then the original, um, uh, you know, configuration of the Milwaukee River. Originally, it came into the lake um, very close to uh, kind of the confluence with the Kinnikinnik River or the, the very tip of the turning basin that we have now. And we'll see some maps of that. But, um, you know, and it, Milwaukee really is here because of the access that the rivers provided, you know, to the hinterland. So, where we could go and, and farm and log and, you know, get natural resources. Um, but, you know, the, the Milwaukee River is, goes obviously to the north, the Menominee to the west, and the Kinnikinnik to the south. So, um, you know, we, it really was a, an excellent port for providing um, access to, to the land within there. So um, this is kind of a cool uh, set of maps, and the credit really goes to um, UWM's Environmental Justice Lab that kind of put some of these together. Um, and you really can just see a snapshot over time of how the city has changed and how the city also changed the rivers in the process. And I'm not sure if you guys can see, can you see my cursor if I'm moving things around? Yes, no, maybe so. Um, yeah. Oh, great. Um, so this is the original kind of 18, well, not the original, but an early map of Milwaukee from 1836, where you really still see the, the natural configuration of the rivers here. Um, and then in 1848, um, you know, this is kind of this map here. Milwaukee had just been founded two years earlier than that. You can already see huge changes here where 
essentially we've drained a lot of the wetlands and marshes and are really dramatically expanding the water area here. Um, you know, and clearly there's a lot of filling um, that happened for many, many decades um, to create more land out of what essentially, you know, was really a, a marsh, um, probably when, when the first uh, white settlers came here and, and probably even before then. Oops, let me go back here. So um, the, the interesting thing is the Milwaukee, the straight, what we call the straight cut, which is what currently is where the Milwaukee River meets Lake Michigan, was actually put in around 1857. And so this is a map from 1870. So somewhere in between these two maps, you know, they came in and built this direct cut. And you can see Jones Island in here, which really no longer exists. This is all kind of just land now, obviously. Um, well, and actually part of it's the, the inner port of Milwaukee. Uh, and part of Jones Island is, is still there, but cannot, you know, connected to, uh, connected to the land now. Um, but anyway, this is kind of the, the, the big change that happened. And you can see down here, the original opening of the river. And it is pretty interesting because in the Inner Harbor, people often ask me, you know, people will refer to this Inner Harbor area as the Kinnikinnik, but really it was the Milwaukee River. The Kinnikinnik originally did come in much further to the south. So I think a big part of that inner port of Milwaukee, um, you know, technically really is probably the Milwaukee River. But again, you can just see more and more of those changes um, especially on the Menominee here, you go from a natural river to a very extensive, you know, um, canal system that was being built fairly early on in the 1870s. Um, again, lots of lots of modifications into the port um, and the way that we have it, to, we see it today. Um, and, you know, clearly that caused a lot of water quality problems and also um, pretty significant issues for, for wildlife habitat and, and critters that were using the water. Um, so these are just kind of some other fun pictures and slides. Um, I, I got to do a presentation for the um, Historical Society a few months back and um, had some fun going through their archives and looking at some of the pictures. But again, this is, um, this is actually a shot from 1885 uh, and just some of the early maps, um, but really showing, you know, kind of the difference in what these rivers would have looked like at the time when we had big ships like this coming in um, to Milwaukee. Uh, and then again, you see that, that kind of straight cut that was put in in the, in the late 1850s um, so that these big you know, ships would it'd be easier for them to kind of get in and, and um, access the city. Um, similarly, this is a, an early picture from the Library of Congress of the Menominee Valley. And you know, fairly early on, it really became uh, obviously a, a very important part of the city for manufacturing. Um, you know, we were shipping out you know, grain and animal products and um, lots of other, uh, you know, increasingly as, as time went on, manufactured goods, um, you know, but this was really kind of like the powerhouse of the city. And um, it's just always, I think, kind of cool to see these early renderings and, and in some cases, pictures of, of what that area looked like, because it, it, there's a pretty significant transformation in, in the valley as well. Uh, and these are just some more pictures, again, of, of some of the canals. Um, for folks who are, who are aware kind of of what things look like now, um, this was essentially, this is what we have as the current modern day Burnham Canal. Um, and this whole section here would be kind of pretty close to the, the current, uh, what we call the South Menominee Canal. But you can see that, you know, even back in the late 1800s, there was a lot more canals uh, kind of dug through the valley. Um, this canal is actually very close to where the post office is on St. Paul, for folks who are familiar with that. Um, and then you can see it here on this, in this map too from, um, I think this is a 1900 map, but uh, a lot of these kind of connector kind of canals have all been filled in over time for industry, but we still do have this, which is the South Menominee and the Burnham Canal. Uh, and then this is what I was mentioning too, that was had the post office. So, you know, we were very, um, we, we really moved the rivers around. The Menominee too was obviously straightened to make it easier for shipping. It was deepened, it was hardened with seawalls, as was, you know, most of the Milwaukee and, and the lower Kinnikinnik as well. Um, and, you know, and clearly that, really disconnected the river from the floodplains and also, um, you know, made it much harder for, for wildlife to get back and forth from the water to the land, uh, you know, and, and really caused, um, you know, a, a lot of issues that in a, in a lot of ways we're still dealing with today. Those decisions that were made, you know, 100, in some cases, 150 years ago are still uh, kind of there affecting the rivers for sure. Um, again, just some other fun pictures of, uh, Jones Island. This is actually pretty interesting because this, I think this is fairly close to where my office is now at the School of Freshwater Sciences, kind of looking off into uh, Jones Island, which I think a lot of us have heard about, um, which was, you know, largely settled by Kashubes and 
Um, the, you know, folks lived on, on Jones Island until the early 1900s. And I think the last uh, person uh, from Jones Island who left was kind of in the early 1920s, I believe. But, you know, obviously huge changes um, to, to uh, the, the port and also to the, the Jones Island uh, area. And, and obviously a lot of this came in um, because of the, the sewage treatment plant that came in in the early 1920s. And uh, we, you know, we were really one of the first cities, in particular in the Midwest, to really build a sewage treatment plant um, because the, the pollution had gotten so severe, um, especially in the lower Milwaukee River, uh, that that kind of was deemed necessary. And that was the main reason why a lot of the Kashubes were, were forced out. Um, so just throwing in there, you know, early on, the, the pollution was kind of evident um, in the rivers. I think, and I actually should have, I didn't know Dave was gonna be on this call, but I have another, um, some very cool old articles about Lincoln Creek as well, catching on fire. But, um, you know, I think a lot of people remember the Cuyahoga, obviously, and some of the more, uh, you know, famous fires. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we, we had our own issues here. A lot of times, you know, filth and grease were on the water, pretty easily uh, caught fire if somebody was burning leaves or, or uh, you know, or a, a building nearby maybe caught on fire. Um, and so if you go back and kind of look at some of the Journal Sentinel archives, there's, there were quite a few uh, fires, but the, this was a big one on the KK and there was also a pretty large one um, on Lincoln Creek as well. Um, and also early on, you know, the Kinnikinnik started flooding, um, again, because you had a lot of people moving into, you know, moving their houses into a, a river that even, you know, kind of in the early 1900s was, was uh, pretty flashy and having some issues. Um, and so these are just kind of some early pictures from, from the KK. But, um, you know, a lot of people developed very, in a, very densely in, in this watershed, and we'll talk a little bit more about uh, the impacts that we see there still to this day. But, you know, fairly early on, I think the, the filling in of wetlands to accommodate development um, and a lot of other decisions that were made, um, you know, caused uh, issues that, again, we're, we're still dealing with. Uh, again, another some other uh, pictures of, of flooding here in the KK. So in the 1950s and 60s, you know, what did what did they do with the flooding? So I think at the time, you know, the engineers of the day, <laughs> uh, and some of them are still around and they're pretty interesting to talk to. But you know, I think that the thought was, well, the way that we're going to deal with this flooding is we're just going to channelize all these creeks with concrete. This is an early picture from um, the 1960s, right after the the channel was put in. But you know, I think the sense was, and I think you know, not wasn't nefarious. I think objective, but they thought, well, we'll just you know send the water into this concrete channel, and it'll move really quickly away from these these folks that are flooding, and that'll that'll solve the problem, you know. Um, and essentially, what happened is, as we know now, it just kind of sent that flooding problem further downstream and further downstream. Um, and then, in the case of the KK in particular, but also many of our other urban creeks. Um, you know, we ended up with almost, you know, a large, probably 80% of the stream miles in the Kinnikinnik are, are concretized now. And so that was a very expensive uh, endeavor, obviously, to put these things in. And we're now spending, you know, very significant amount of money uh, to take it out. Uh, so again, early on, just some, some pictures, kind of old pictures and also new pictures, but, of, you know, a lot of the, the water quality issues that we started having in the KK because of that concrete channel, channelization in some ways, um, you know, in combination with urban development, it also is just much easier for that pollution to run off into the waterways. Um, and even today, you know, we're still really challenged with that. The Kinnikinnik now is around 95% urban or developed. And so when it rains, we get an incredible amount of, of runoff from the land that quickly goes into the river and, and causes uh, quite a lot of significant water quality problems. So um, again, on the, on, on the, this is just some fun old pictures of North Ave, or kind of near the North Avenue area um, on the Milwaukee River. Again, I think a lot of folks have probably seen these, but they're always really fun. Um, this is actually a, the Gordon Park Swimming School, which is just south of Locust Avenue. Um, and the old, you know, pilings from the beach house, or I shouldn't say the beach house, I guess the swimming house, um, are still there in Gordon Park and you can still, um, you know, kind of play around on those and they've become quite graffiti filled murals. <laughs> um, very, you know, bright kind of fun graffiti there. But, um, you know, this was, a, you know, the part of the river where there was a lot of recreation um, back in the early 1900s. You could argue that the water was probably not very good water quality back then either. Um, as kind of everything was getting put into the rivers. And certainly in 1921, we still didn't have Jones Island fully operational at that point. 
So there's a lot of sewage and other um, contaminants certainly that were up there, but um, you know, having North Avenue in place in particular did allow for a much larger impoundment um, in Riverside Park and Gordon Park and kind of just plopping these in too to give some perspective about some work that we're going to talk about later. But you know, a lot of um, there, this was a, a very big recreation area further upstream in Hubbard Park and Lincoln Park. You know, there were like, uh, well, Hubbard Park had a full on several series of, uh, you know, kind of entertainment parks, kind of the great Americas of the day, <laughs> uh, amusement parks that were along the river. And, I, you know, I think the Blacks Pavilion, too, was quite a place to go. Uh, so, you know, it was a kind of a, a big entertainment hub for the city. Um, uh, and so, you know, that, that there was some major changes obviously made to, to North Avenue Dam that, that uh, you know, that were positive and that um, have opened up a lot of opportunities, but also this kind of context is important for some of what we'll talk about in a second here. So again, just another um, little bit more information about North Avenue Dam. We were just seeing kind of some pictures from, you know, Gordon Park and Riverside Park, which were upstream, but uh, you know, North Avenue Dam, the very first one was created in 1835, which was, you know, well before the, the city, Milwaukee was even a city. Um, and it was really created for milling and factory purposes. Um, and there was a mill race actually created um, close to present day Commerce Street. Um, and partly, you know, I think it originally probably started as a mill race for industry. At one point, they were talking about turning it into a canal. Um, you know, and there were these crazy schemes of connecting the Milwaukee River to the, the Mississippi, um, you know, via, I think, probably connecting to the Fox River at some point. Um, but, you know, all of those things kind of uh, fell apart over time. And then, you know, the dam essentially was finally removed in the, in the late 90s. Um, and this is kind of uh, looking just upstream from where the, the former dam was. But, you know, that was, I think, one of the very first um, really transformative projects uh, certainly in our area um, on the Milwaukee River. And I think a lot for a lot of folks that were around when that happened, um, you know, that made a really massive change in water quality, just opening up uh, the river through that section. And, you know, I think fairly quickly they went from, you know, having a, about four species of fish to close to 30. Uh, and I think we're now up at around in the mid 40s somewhere as far as species of fish in the downtown section of the river. So, you know, removing that, that dam was very transformative. Um, and then of course, you know, the, the big opportunity that it created was um, a lot of that land that was formerly kind of the big impoundment um, behind the dam is now exposed and you have these, you know, ribbons of green on both sides. Um, and as I think a lot of folks know, uh, you know, that this is the area that essentially became the Milwaukee River Greenway um, and we just finished, I think, uh, celebrating 15 weeks of fun activities and, uh, you know, Dave's group was involved with that and a lot of other great groups that were part of the Greenway Coalition um, to just celebrate the, the 15, you know, 15 years since our really our coalition started to protect this area. And it's really about eight miles of river and about 878 acres that were protected, um, essentially via what we call an overlay zone. So. Um, in lieu of having to rezone, you know, what I think was close to 900 properties that were really zoned whatever, you know, the adjacent property used to be because a lot of this area was underwater before and no one really cared what the zoning was, right? It just became the same zoning as the closest upstream property. Um, and so, you know, we were having a lot of problems with people coming in here and clear cutting um, because there wasn't really any, there weren't any local protections against that. And also, the properties weren't really zoned park or protected area. They were zoned commercial, industrial. Um, so, you know, and, and I think a lot of these areas, there would have been problems developing because there were floodplains and there would have been a lot of barriers to development. But we certainly wanted to go in and, and just proactively protect this area, set some rules in place um, regarding, you know, things like stormwater runoff, regarding even the design standards for adjacent buildings and how tall they could be. Um, you know, making sure that if, if trees were removed, that they were being replaced um, appropriately. And, and this area, you know, I think has become not only, I mean, it, it always has been, but uh, it's continuing to improve year after year with a lot of really great work from partners like Urban Ecology and River Revitalization Foundation and a lot of the neighborhood and community organizations that are, you know, working on removing invasives and putting in trails and just making this area, I think, each year a better and better asset for the community. So, um, you know, and a lot of this opportunity really was because of removing that dam. Um, and, you know, there, there was definitely probably cons 
in that some of the recreational opportunities, you know, certainly were lost at that time. Um, but, you know, there's also the huge pros is that we have this amazing resource now and um, we can have these really amazing wilderness experiences right in the middle of the city, which I think is quite unique, um, you know, anywhere you go, uh, certainly in this country and I think even beyond. So, you know, that's uh, uh, something that's great. Um, the one thing, and I'm not really sure uh, that it did cause was that, so a lot of this area that was underwater previously, um, you know, there were a lot of contaminants in that water. Uh, a lot of uh, trash was removed before the dam was actually taken out in this section. Uh, I think folks will know that they, the DNR came in and put in this, it's called uh, articulated concrete mat, but it's essentially like a blocks, like almost brick mats that they put in. Um, because at the time, I think again, um, you know, at the benefit, I guess, looking at the benefit of hindsight, uh, we would have much preferred they came in here and just removed all of the PCBs and contamination that was down there. Um, at the time, there were, wasn't the funding for that. Um, we did have a, a very similar funding programs in place at that time as we do now, but the big difference is we don't have this infusion of, you know, $400 million or so that we've been getting annually for the last, uh, you know, probably close to 15, 16 years now. Um, so there just wasn't funding in that program to, to pay for it at the time, unfortunately. Um, but, you know, a lot of this area now that is the Greenway, there are some contaminants in place. Um, and so uh, just was gonna talk quickly about some of that and set up some of the work that's gonna be happening in the future. Um, I think a lot of folks are, are familiar with the work that happened in Lincoln Park over about, I think it was probably around six, seven years of work by many folks um, where they came in and cleaned up a lot of PCBs and PHs, um, you know, first from kind of the, the Blast Pavilion kind of happened first in 2008. And then they did this, the West Oxbo first, and then kind of came in and did some spot dredging in, in these sections of the river. Um, and then kind of upstream of Esterbrook Dam as well. I think in total, all three of those projects were like over $50 million, um, which is, you know, is a very, very significant investment. Um, because of the flows in this area, they were able to actually pound in, um, you know, steel sheet piling in some areas and dewater these areas and then completely go in there with, with machines to remove a lot of that contamination. Um, this is not really something that's probably going to happen in um, these future projects um, would just be way too uh, difficult. Uh, you know, the low flows and in, 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 uh, in kind of the Oxbow areas in particular allowed for, for that to happen. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the really cool thing about this project or big thing was that a lot of the, the Milwaukee River models that have been done by people who are, you know, wonkier than I um, have showed that they think about 70% of the PCBs in this river system were in kind of this part of Lincoln Park. Um, and just because of hydrologically, the, the way the river is so flat through here and slow, um, just a, a lot of sediment has deposited, deposited here, uh, you know, in the past. So removing a lot of that sediment, you know, we think we've got about probably 70% of the total loading of PCBs in the system. But, um, you know, there still is, um, you know, this is the Esterberg Park Dam. And so I just mentioned that we removed all of this. Um, and then of course we were able to remove the dam in 2018. Um, and these are just some before and after pictures, which I love, um, which were taken by Peter Thornquist, who I think some folks know, um, who's on our board. But, um, you know, removing that those PCBs were really critical to making this project happen. Um, you know, not to belabor it, because I think all of you guys, certainly at Sierra Club, followed this, but, um, you know, it was going to be around five to seven million to fix it, and we thought two million to remove it, but it ended up taking about a million dollars, um, but, uh, and actually it was happening, I think, a lot quicker than most of us had thought um, it would take. It was very kind of shocked how fast the gates in particular came down, like, I think it was like within like three days or something, they had most of that out. Um, but, um, you know, that was a, a big project um, that, I, you know, I think is a huge benefit as far as water quality and, and fish passage, wildlife organism passage. Um, the big thing, though, is so downstream from Estabrook, there is, there are still some um, contamination because, the, you know, the way the dam operated for years, it was, the dams were kind of opened and the gates were opened and closed for recreation, you know, to create more of a ponded environment and the, from the spring to the fall. Um, and then they really were open the last 10 years of the life of the dam from about 2008 to 2018. So, you know, there, there historically what was a lot of flushing of sediment and water downstream. And so um, that the whole section of the Milwaukee really downstream from Estabrook 
all the way to the mouth of the river, um, there are accumulations of sediment. Um, I would say in the greenway section, um, most of that sediment that we're looking at is in the floodplain. So it's that, again, that those early pictures of, of that lake. Um, a lot of the, the sediment of concern is in the floodplain. Some of it's very deep um, and might not be removed and some of it's closer to the surface. And um, you know, they're gonna look to see whether it could be safely removed and whether the, you know, the pros outweigh the cons of, of doing that. Um, the river itself moves pretty well downstream of Estabrook with a couple exceptions to that statement. <laughs> um, so there's not a lot of sediment depth, you know, deposition until you get really downstream of the former North Avenue Dam where you have that old, you know, area that was dredged about 25 feet back in the day for those big ships. Um, and that it was so deep and it's, we're probably now closer to, you know, I would guess around eight feet of depth and that's how much sediment has filled that in over the years. Um, however, you know, there's still a lot of uh, the, the most toxic stuff I think that we found is largely downstream of North Avenue Dam. And so that section of the river, which is kind of, you know, what we call the Condo Canyon now, um, that area will be the one that's, um, I think most of the work will be happening. Um, you know, should we get the, the federal money that we think we're gonna get to, to remove all of the, these PCBs in the next five years or so. So uh, this is maybe a, a map I should have had up when I was talking about all of this. So um, this is uh, pretty close to, uh, let's see here, where are we? Uh, this is fairly close to where Estabrook Dam was. Um, and so this, this, this isn't really the whole Milwaukee River map, but this whole uh, bottom section is kind of what I'm talking about. Um, so in addition to removing a lot of the, the sediments that are, are downstream, we also, um, some of the other projects that are being proposed are to do kind of a, lot, a more large scale restoration of Lincoln Park that would essentially just really encourage more flow to come through the center section. Um, the river, again, I don't wanna make people dizzy with my cursor, but the river used to do like an S curve here that was something like this. So it kind of came down to the right and then went up and then kind of came back down. And again, in, in, um, back in the early 20s, as part of kind of some of the, the large CCC camps that were in the area and the work that was done, um, you know, they came in here and created a straight cut here um, you know, a lot of this part of the river and, and going all the way further downstream to Estabrook Falls was quarried. Um, a lot of rock was taken out, so the river was deepened as well. Um, but, you know, the, the hydrology here was, was impacted and changed quite significantly. So we have a lot of surface area for the water to go, and it's fairly slow and flat in here. So I think that we don't really, this is all very still in the beginning stages, but they're MMSD who's really leading this project. Um, and who also, you know, obviously was the ultimate uh, folks that took the dam out. Um, you know, there, it looks like a lot of the, the alternatives that are being looked at kind of focus on trying to get better flow through the center section and then doing like a lot of kind of habitat improvements on, on the sides, which we call the oxbows. And, and then at Esterbrook Park as well, this is kind of a, a pretty calendar pick there of Lincoln Park. <laughs> um, the Esterbrook Falls, which I think, again, a lot of folks are familiar with near the Esterbrook Beer Garden, of course. Um, you know, this section, too, they're looking at um, doing some improvements here, potentially to get fish to come up. Um, we do occasionally see salmon make it through actually right here. Um, even just recently, there's some documentation of white suckers that have made it past this side. Um, so the, right now, there's a consultant that's been hired um, called Interfluve. And they're looking at this whole section. Um, originally, we were thinking of trying to put a fish passage here on um, kind of a river right for the paddlers in the room. Um, I think now they're also looking kind of at this river left um, because of some recent, not, you know, kind of just observations and, and stuff since they've been out there studying. So they're going to be looking at, you know, if maybe they need to put a notch in here somewhere to try to get the fish up. The problem with that, of course, is then you're funneling more water to that notch and then you're increasing the flow. And a lot of our native fish, and in particular, this is really being built to accommodate fish like northern pike, which only swims like 1.4 feet per second and cannot jump at all. Um, they're very poor swimmers. It's amazing that they survive. Um, <laughs> and so this is really being, you know, kind of designed to accommodate the pike um, and then also the, st the sturgeon, of course. And there's been four different recent um, sightings, I guess is the word, or uh, we've confirmed four different sturgeon kind of basically meet, it, meet this point. Um, DNR has, and there was a great Journal Sentinel article by Paul Smith about that. 
But these are a sturgeon actually that have been introduced over the last uh, 10 or so years that River Edge has been introducing sturgeon. So some exciting stuff, but this actually too is a pretty large uh, barrier during dry weather for, for sturgeon to get up. So they're also looking at um, essentially accommodating sturgeon. Um, for folks who are familiar with the river section downstream of here too, there's uh, what we call the old ice dam, which historically was an ice dam that they created to uh, facilitate going in and cutting out blocks of ice for ice boxes, um, which is kind of just upstream a ways from um, Locust, kind of adjacent to uh, Pump Station Park. That area too, they're looking at to see if there's anything we need to do, just minor modifications probably to, to help fish get through there. Uh, it's sounding that, that no one's super concerned about that area, but they are looking at that and then even going down to North Avenue, whether there need to be some changes in that area where the blocks were put in. Uh, and if folks, paddlers in particular, are familiar with that area, a lot of really weird scour holes and um, parts of that uh, blocking system that's heaved up. Uh, and so we asked, the city had had some plans to deal with that and had some lawsuits, but it, it just doesn't seem like it's gonna happen. So I think as part of this project, they're looking at that as well to see if we could maybe tie in any work that might need to happen down there. All right, I am long-winded per usual. So I'm gonna quick pick up the pace, but I think, I think everybody at, um, I'm certainly as part of this group is very familiar with the Menominee Valley. So I'll just probably swing through that pretty quickly. But I mean, these pictures are pretty incredible. This is the same bridge. Um, and actually I think it's the same bridge, but kind of looking at it from the opposite side. <laughs> um, but you know, the, the Menominee Valley was like the real workhorse for the city, similar to some of the other pictures I showed you earlier. At one point, um, you know, 80% of the nation's rail cars were being made in the Menominee Valley, which I think is still pretty incredible. Um, but, you know, even I've been here around 20 years, and when I first came here, there were sections of the Menominee that still kind of look like this um, when I first moved here. Uh, and it was, you know, there was some huge obstacles to cleaning that area up because of the level of contamination. And, um, you know, there's just been some really amazing work done by the city and uh, Menominee Valley Partners and a bunch of different groups to, uh, you know, get this area cleaned up. And, um, of course, uh, wonderful stormwater management has been put in to also facilitate and kind of attract businesses and jobs. And we've also been able, this is all kind of cool flood management that also uh, helped us put in a canoe launch uh, just upstream of here at 37th Street. Um, but there's just been some really amazing work done in the valley. Um, clearly, you know, there are huge barriers, like every single little low area in the valley or wetland or anything was filled with God knows coal and ash and foundry ash and you know anytime there are restoration projects or stormwater projects we are digging that stuff up um, so it is it does make things challenging but there's been just some really phenomenal work um, that continues to happen in the valley um, these are just kind of some fun this is an in I don't I'm kind of kicking myself I, I have to find a good before picture of the section of the Menominee but this is um, right in the beginning when they were taking the concrete out upstream of Miller Park um, this is that same area before they even had rewatered the river. Um, and these pictures, actually, the river's in these pipes. Um, and this is kind of rainwater, really. But they came in and removed the concrete as much as they could. Um, there's some very significant flooding in this Valley Park neighborhood, which a lot of us call Pigsville. But I guess they don't want to be called Pigsville anymore. <laughs> um, sadly, I like Pigsville. Um, but the, this area, there's, you know, very high flood risk. Um, so there was, a, you know, some pretty big limitations to what could happen here and the, the flood wall had to remain. Um, but, you know, the, removing the concrete has been huge. It's really uh, slowed the flow down and uh, some of the, the other parts of this project. So the, all the concrete's out now in the lower Menominee. There have been pools and riffles put in place um, in different sections that kind of slowly um, slow the water, provide some pools and areas for fish to rest. Um, to be able to get them up this section because um, historically the flow through this section was so extreme it was very difficult even for you know occasionally you get a very strong salmon or a very strong steelhead trout that could get through that concrete section um, and make its way to Tosa or something but we're now seeing fish getting way up to Menominee Falls. I was um, like maybe two years ago doing a big restoration project on Pioneer Road uh, in Menominee Falls, and we were seeing spawning salmon that far up north. So, uh, you know, it's really been a pretty huge, uh, uh, I think, project to facilitate fish passage in particular and, and you know, improve fisheries. 
Um, this is kind of a in, in this is a, a pre picture of Underwood Creek, which was concrete with a lot of you know buckthorn and some trees popping through the cracks. Um, and then this is a construction picture that was taken of Underwood Creek when that concrete was taken out. Um, and then this is just kind of a picture right after construction. And I need to run out and get another like a better uh, after picture. But um, you know MMSC was leading this project as well. Um, for a lot of complicated reasons, but partly because they really are the flood manager of the region, um, and their you know their system is very tied in with the rivers because of their um, you know the way the system's designed and where the overflow points are and, and what how the water levels can change during those extreme weather, weather events with and without overflows. So you know I think historically they became the flood manager, and there's a lot of really good reasons for doing that. Um, but you know they I think in the last few years like where they, the, the transformation and kind of these projects, I would say from Lincoln Creek, which Dave and others are really familiar with, which was their very first project really to do this type of work. Um, you know, I think this, we're calling kind of the gold standard now in restoration. Um, you know, and I would not to say that there aren't major improvements that could be made, but, you know, they're using natural river rock. They were, they were really, uh, you know, I think have changed the designs pretty significantly and there's a big cost that comes associated with that as well. But um, I think it's, um, you know, the projects are getting better and better and I think that's really exciting. And I certainly hope we can kind of go back in and, and fix some stuff on Lincoln Creek and, and some of those early projects that, that were done. Um, these are just some other examples of projects that we've done in the last few years at Riverkeeper. Um, but, you know, we've gone in with DNR and removed small dams and in this picture, this was a this used to be a big pond. Um, this is Pigeon Creek in uh, Mequon. Uh, this is the that project I just mentioned on the Menominee at, at um, Pioneer Road, but it was a very serious eroding bank that was very close to taking a road out um, that we were able to kind of come in and stabilize. And um, not pictured here, but there's some we've got some very pretty um, kind of sensitive native plants that we put in, um, and then also there's a an access here. We're calling it a canoe launch, but the Menominee is pretty rough to canoe for folks who've tried it. Um, but it's really kind of a, a river access for hopefully canoeing at some point in time, but for uh, definitely easy river access and, and fishing access. Um, these are some projects that were done um, in partnership with MMSD in the city of Wauwatosa uh, to remove some low flow barriers and, and Hoyt Park that were really big barriers to um, fish passage, uh, this, these are kind of some before and afters um, of, of just removing those barriers. And then, so four of them ended up being removed. One was a, oops, I don't have a picture of it, but there was one kind of active uh, sewer that is an active sewer to the Hoyt Park pool that could not be removed because that would be bad. So that um, pipe was addressed by um, essentially putting in a large ramp of rock to allow fish to get through. And and I think, you know, maybe of interest here, this one's a little bit of a different story because it was, we're not, it seems like this was put in intentionally uh, to kind of create a falls and to create an access to a former um, public works yard. But, um, you know, a lot of these barriers were pipes that were probably put at the time several feet below the river um, in concrete boxes to protect the pipe. And, you know, the river just eats away at that over the years. Um, Any, you know, it'll keep eating down and digging down until it hits something really hard, normally bedrock or something, right? And um, often, you know, in that process, and in the Menominee in particular has become a very um, flashy stream, you know, feast or famine as far as water levels. And we're now at about 80% urban in the Menominee. Um, so there's still some really huge construction happening in the headwaters too, which is, um, I think, making it a little difficult to achieve kind of some of the water quality goals we're trying to achieve in, in the Menominee. But um, you know, these, uh, a lot of the rivers themselves have just been creating these little dam structures. So um, it's been a big deal to be able to remove that. Um, so just a couple other uh, quick uh, uh, projects that are coming up that folks have probably heard about, but this is Honey Creek where it comes into Hart Park in Wauwatosa. Um, there's a large section of concrete channel here that's going to be taken out. Um, again, hopefully in the next couple of years. Um, this is not part of the area of concern project. It's being led by the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, and then MMSD is also a, a partner on that in Wauwatosa. And, uh, you know, they've been pretty great, too, about involving us in the Friends of Honey Creek and some of the, the local stakeholder groups. But the plans are to come in here and remove concrete as well. Um, we really wanted this to go all the way to the highway. We're still kind of working on it. Um, <laughs> 
the short version of the story is that um, everyone's afraid of this section because it's so close to the highway. This is I-94. Actually, no, I'm, I'm lying. I think that's Blue Mountain. I-94 is further down. Um, it really starts at this utility um, kind of part, uh, kind of crossing that is, I think, just north of Blue Mound. Um, anyway, they um, this the section that's kind of downstream of the highway. They're afraid that there's going to be a lot of contamination there, um, and so they've decided to kind of start with this section, and then we're still trying to figure out um, kind of the upstream uh, what's going to happen. Um, let's see here. So. Uh, you know, this they're going to be taking a lot of the concrete out, which is great. For folks who know this section, it's in really bad shape. In a lot of cases, there's failing culverts, and there's some areas with old WPA wall that they're trying to preserve. Um, but there's areas even where the river has gone behind the WPA wall, and they're still not saying they're taking those out, which I find interesting. Um, but anyway, it's going to be a pretty interesting project. They're also planning on doing a really significant um, invasive species removal and kind of riparian restoration project, which is something I have not seen the Corps do um, historically. And I think that's going to be a huge asset to the creek and I think to the friends groups that are starting here too, um, because they hopefully will be able to do a lot of the heavy lifting um, of, some, of getting out some of the worst of, of the, the, you know, really intense infestations of invasive species that we have in this section. Um, Burnham Canal too, I think folks have heard about. This is an area of concern project, so it's part of that uh, larger work, um, which I'm going to talk a little bit more in detail about in a second. Probably should have put that in the in the top, but um, this is kind of a picture from actually a couple of weeks ago. I did a doors open paddle, um, so this is kind of current day, and this is the 12th Street Bridge here that goes across the Burnham Canal, um, and this is kind of that same bridge in this rendering. But the idea really is to come in here and. Uh, slowly fill in portions of this channel. The depth here, I think, is still around eight to 10 feet. Again, was probably historically dredged to about 25 feet. Um, so that's kind of too deep for a lot of wetland plants. So the idea is to come in here and do some selective filling. Um, basically, they've already come in and done some uh, removal of contaminants here. Um, just kind of uh, out of the picture here was a uh, business called Miller Compressing, which you actually can see better. It's kind of this whole section here. It was the whole kind of a, a very large section of the north part of the canal on the west side. Um, they uh, were kind of like a industrial recycler. There was a lot of uh, really nasty heavy metals and stuff and also you know garden variety, um, kind of oil and grease and hydrocarbons and stuff that were in here. Um, so there has been quite a lot of dredging both in the channel and on the land. Um, and they've come in and already put a cap in in this section. Um, I've heard that they're going to be putting out an RFP in the next couple of weeks to do the eastern part, like so east of the 12th Street Bridge, they're going to be coming in and capping that. Um, and there was some selective um, contaminant removal there as well. Um, so that, that actually is going to be done separately by the DNR so that we can kind of restore all the canal. Um, and so anyway, it's really exciting. For, I think for quite a while, probably for the next four or some years, um, it's, you're not going to really see anything happening out there. But once they kind of um, get some of the, the elevations dealt with, um, the goal is to come in and really try to do, a, do some restoration here and put in hopefully a canoe or kayak access. Um, so we're really excited about that project. It should be great. So all right, so I'm going to whiz through some KK concrete removal pro, uh, picks. Again, this is kind of closer to the 6th, uh, this is, I think, 10th Street. Um, but the 6th to 16th Street section, which we really thought was going to happen first, is probably going to happen last now, <laughs> partly because a lot of the historic modeling that threw out these crazy storms, right? Like everyone's like, oh, those storms are crazy. They're once in 100 years, once every 500 years. Well, we're getting those now, you know, like every year. And 2018 broke rainfall records, and 2019 broke the 2018 records. Uh, and then 2020, I think, was only the seventh wettest year on record, but everyone kind of realized, well, okay, this is climate change. This is the new normal. So they've changed, the, they're working on changing the model, the models, I should say. I don't think they're going to have to buy more properties because MMSD, I think, has already bought, like, it's like 80 or 82 properties in this section. Um, well, I should say in, in this whole uh, kind of from 6th Street to Jackson Park section. Um, so, but they are um, having to do some redesign to make sure that we're protecting the homes that will remain. Um, but this is kind of a conceptual of what we think it will look like. There will be some version of flood walls to protect the adjoining, adjoining houses. 
Um, and then, you know, a lot of the way that Riverkeeper was involved in 16th Street and a lot of the community orgs was just really trying to talk to the local neighborhoods about, you know, what kind of uses they'd like to see, you know, and, and trying to incorporate as much of that community, um, I guess, benefits piece um, into the designs as possible. Uh, and in some cases, we'll have to do additional fundraising to get some of this stuff done. Um, if MMSC can't pay for it or if it's not funded by other, you know, foundation stuff. Um, this is kind of a fun series. So we've done one, uh, there's, MMSC has done two sections, one downstream of 6th Street, which was done a while back. Um, and then uh, this recent section that just happened in the last two years or so in Pulaski Park. So this is downstream of 6th Street. There was just a very small bit of concrete there um, where it met the natural section. This was kind of where Riverkeeper 2 around 2000, what was it? I think it was around 2006, we started doing these big crane cleanups in this section. And I think some of you folks might've been involved in those cleanups, which were a lot of fun actually. <laughs> but the, the concrete actually came in around here. Um, and so there was kind of a natural channel a little bit in this section. So they came in and did some floodplain modifications, kind of dropped those floodplains down to provide you know, better connectivity between the river and the floodplains to get more of that infiltration and flood management. Um, so this is a picture kind of right after the removal in 2012. And then this is a 2019 picture, so about seven years later. Um, and then this fence is kind of, there's a CSO outfall right here. But um, that, that project, I, you know, was a small project, but pretty successful. So this is a pre-picture of Pulaski Park, which is around 13th Street and the Knicknick. Um, and then shortly after the, the concrete was taken out, this is probably about two years old, this picture. Uh, and then this was from kind of early spring last year, I believe. It might've been early spring this year, actually. Um, sorry, I bet my Zoom thing is blocking some of my titles, so I can't see. <laughs> but uh, this is essentially what uh, it's kind of looking like now. And so hopefully more of the plants will come in. You know, the cons clearly are some, there were some trees that had to come out here. Um, but, you know, this, this channel was so dangerous. I would teach water quality here regularly because um, there's a very nice pavilion um, kind of right around here. And um, it was just so dangerous to even just get down to the river for water samples. Um, and so, I mean, just being able to have a river that looks like a river and doesn't look like a concrete ditch and a much safer place where kids could get down to the river safely. Um, we did have about seven kids that have died in the lower KK in the last few decades. Um, because when you fall into one of those concrete sections, you know, they're so, the water's so fast and the surfaces are so slimy. It's just so difficult to get out of that. Um, so, you know, I think huge changes are afoot here in the KK. Um, I don't think I put um, a slide in here for Jackson Park, which is my bad, but um, Jackson Park, the design is very far along. So it's basically from Miller Parkway, or I think, what are we calling it now? Brewers Boulevard. Um, that, from that area downstream through all of Jackson Park, that concrete's all coming out. There's a large section of, of river that's underneath existing soccer fields that's going to be exposed, what we call daylighted. Um, there's a really ugly dam that's just downstream of um, the Brewers Boulevard, and that dam is coming out. Uh, and so, and essentially too, there's gonna be major changes to the roads, which are constantly flooding. Um, some pretty significant changes to Jackson Park Pond. Um, some, you know, I think are, are, are positive, improving access, improving the shoreline stability. There will be some kind of dredging done in that pond as well to remove some contaminated sediment that's in the pond. Um, but in general, all new um, you know, sports fields and facilities will be put in place in the park. Not all in where the places where they are today, but um, in general, I think it'll be a really awesome project I'm really excited about. So um, just some other quick updates. I realize I'm gonna try to close things up here in the next two or three minutes or so, so we have time for questions. Um, but just for folks who haven't heard of, about the area of concern, and I think most probably have, um, you know, it's, we're really these historic parts of the Great Lakes that really had significant environmental degradation. And so we were flagged by EPA as kind of these areas that were affected by industrial contamination, legacy contamination that needed a little bit more, um, you know, attention for lack of a better word. Um, and so this is just a map of where those are. Clearly we're down here in the Milwaukee. And so there are a lot, um, uh, Waukegan and Sheboygan, which are next door, um, have basically considered all of their management actions are done. They're waiting for some monitoring and other things before they can become delisted. Um, and similarly, the Lower Menominee River is in the same situation. They just very recently um, 
kind of blessed that as, as being done as far as they feel like the actions that they could take um, have been done. And I should say these actions are not really designed. Um, and I always, always used to hate when the EPA guy put it this way, but I'm now seeing, hearing myself say it, but it's, it's not going from an F to an A, it's really going from like an F to a C minus. And I think, or I should, I should say a C, but I think that the goal is not that we don't want these rivers to be a C, you know, we want them to be an A, but this program was really designed to clean up these areas that had really significant legacy um, contamination. You know, and, and it should be noted that, I mean, we didn't even have a Clean Water Act until 1972, right? Which is actually the year of my birth. So, you know, prior to then, anything, you know, anything uh, was kind of open, fair game. So, you know, we had just tremendous amounts of pollution that was happening for a very long time. And so a lot of, you know, it's not shocking, a lot of these cities that you see flagged on this graphic were, you know, industrial big cities. And so, you know, the goal through funding this program isn't to bring everyone back to, you know, pristine, uh, you know, conditions, which in a lot of cases in urban areas is not possible, right? We're always going to have some level of floating trash, you know, realistically after it rains because of the way we've engineered our cities and our streets and our storm drains. Um, but the goal is to kind of get us close to another area. Um, and in our case, we often use Racine as kind of our, the city that we look at. So to kind of get us close to other urban cities that didn't have the same level of this historic contamination. And, and a lot of that is looked at for a lot of these different um, impairments that we have. Um, I think I have a list of them somewhere, but um, you know, we're basically kind of trying to get to a, um, what we think is kind of healthy, what, what's attainable for an urban area. So this is a map of the area of concern. Originally, it was really just that estuary, which were those early historic pictures I was showing you. Um, where, you know, we did a lot of the modification, the filling, the channeling, the straightening, the seawalling. Um, and then, you know, some years back, they expanded the AOC to kind of start downstream of several large Superfund sites. This is, was the Kermagee uh, site on the Little Menominee River, which is now considered closed. That's a whole other hour presentation I could talk about. Um, and then this other part of the um, AOC is basically downstream of the Mercury Marine uh, cleanup site, which is also still ongoing. Um, so those are also technically um, eligible for funding. I will say EPA is really kind of prioritizing, it seems to me, more of the, the work closer to the core, if that makes sense, of, or the original AOCs. So these are our use impairments, and this is just a long kind of sad list, but it's essentially, you know, the, the uses that aren't, we don't, the things that we're not able to use anymore on the river. And so I think the goal of the, the, this AOC program is to really restore these uses so that, you know, people can safely eat fish and not have to worry about whether they're safe to eat. And, um, you know, we'll be able to do dredging for, you know, for commerce and recreational purposes and not have to worry about, you know, the serious industrial contamination that's found on the, that dirt. Um, you know, making sure that the, the conditions are such that our fish and wildlife populations are safe um, and healthy and we're addressing kind of contamination levels that um, are causing other issues. Um, you know, similarly, we're also trying to do some habitat work. Um, there's kind of limitations on that, but there are about 20 different proposed habitat projects in the Milwaukee estuary, going on the Milwaukee River all the way up to Mequon area. Um, the Menominee River, it's most of the main stem in Milwaukee County, I would say, in some portions of the Little Menominee River. Um, and then the Connect Connect, we have some habitat projects going down to about 6th Street. And a couple of those have, have happened already, and others are um, will kind of uh, happen over time, hopefully. Um, but anyway, there's also a beach kind of uh, beaches are part of this and trying to make sure that we're cleaning up the beaches um, as much as possible so that they're safer to use. Um, and then we did recently remove the degradation of aesthetics impairment. And if people are interested in that, I can talk more about that. So our goal is to delist this area of concern, which is really cleaning it up and trying to restore some of the natural function by removing those toxic pollutants, planting vegetation, creating habitat, removing invasive species, stuff like that. Um, again, um, a, lot of the, a lot of these impairments are really so associated with that toxic sediment. Um, for example, fish tumors, the way that that's looked at, and I, I won't get super geeky on you, but um, we look at actually liver tumors in the fish so they will euthanize a certain amount of normally white suckers and look at how many liver tumors they have. And as it turns out, um, in the Milwaukee River, we about 20% of the fish that are sampled have liver tumors. 
And that is because, again, it's not something you would see on the outside of the fish necessarily. You sometimes can see deformities on the outside of fishes, um, which may or may not have anything to do with the, with the sediment. But, um, you know, the, the, a lot of that is due to uh, white suckers in particular really are hanging out at the bottom of the river. So they're very susceptible to that contamination that's bound to the sediments down there. So our goal is to get from that 20% to 11%, um, which is coincidentally like what the tumor rate is in, in a city like we're seeing. So again, we'd love to get that down to zero and we're working to get there, but um, EPA is going to you know, fund that much. And so in some of these goals to delist these uh, impairments are like that specific. Um, and those are the ones I tend to like more because they're very quantifiable and it's obvious when you've met your, your goal. Um, some of our other, uh, impairments, it's a, there's a little bit more squishiness for lack of a better word, but um, so this map just kind of shows areas where we've already done, you know, quite a lot of completed projects. This is the Lincoln Park project. This is a large um, uh, project, which I thought they actually had on here, but I might've accidentally deleted the slide, but we did have about a $20 million uh, dredging project on the lower KK back about 2008 or so. Um, and there has been some spot dredging in some other places. Um, most of these colors are investigations underway are complete. Um, yeah, so that's, and so I should say too, on the lower Menominee, there's going to be also some dredging probably downstream of 25th Street, which is where City Lights Brewing is. And that was the city's first uh, coal gasification plant there. So this whole lower part of the Menominee will also have some dredging projects as well. And then they're, they're kind of getting the data back in the, what we call the turning basin, which is that, you know, the area where the original Milwaukee River used to come in kind of down here. But anyway, um, there will be, there's quite a lot of contaminants in there, but it's not really as bad as a lot of us feared, which is good, I think good news. So I think we're gonna come out, you know, we're not gonna be at like Fox River levels of, of contamination, but we're certainly um, going to be spending a lot of money, that's for sure. So again, just a lot of this work, you know, it's important for the river obviously, but it's really also, you know, I think gonna be transformative for the community. Um, some of the, the other projects that have gone underway in Sheboygan and places like Buffalo, they've seen just, you know, huge benefits to tourism and property values and, you know, two to three dollars come in for every federal dollar. So we're really just kind of making this push to make Milwaukee a priority. We have been listed as a priority by EPA in their recent Great Lakes Action Plan. Um, and so there's a lot of work quickly to try to get us kind of in the a pipeline to get a lot of this funding. Um, I think folks know we're getting normally around 350 to 375 million a year now through this Great Lakes restoration, um, which has allowed for really the acceleration of the cleanup of a lot of these AOCs. Since, um, you know, really some of this work to start the Great Lakes restoration initiative started under the Bush administration, but certainly a lot of the money started flowing during the Obama administration. Um, but that's made a, a really, you know, it's been a really big deal. And we're also looking at another billion potentially that's right now in this infrastructure bill, the bipartisan infrastructure bill, um, that would be additional funding um, put into this program. So we're certainly hoping to get our, our hands on some of that if and when that's ever passed. Um, and then just, oops, lastly, I think I'll just end here. Um, this is, these are just some different um, websites that you can go to. Certainly if you're not um, Riverkeeper members already, you can just sign up to also just be on our newsletter that comes out every two weeks or so, our, which we call Riverkeeper News, or just follow us on social media. We've been trying to push out all of the, the project related information and public info. There's also the, a, a portal that's being kind of still under construction. That's this Milwaukee Waterway Partners .org. This is all of the partners. So it's all like DNR and you know, all the counties and the city of Milwaukee and, um, you know, all of the different, Ozaki County, a lot of the NGOs are all kind of going to put all of this information, hopefully in one place for the public. And there is like a home about in the projects tab. Right now, we just have two of these projects up right now. Um, and I didn't have time to talk about this, but um, basically there, there will be, that will be populated with more and more information, hopefully in the, in the coming weeks. And folks can always reach out to me as well. I think just lastly, I would say we're finishing up our 2020 report card. Um, I don't really want to go through all of this, but we're uh, the grade is better in 2020 than it was in 2019. I think we're at about a C minus, um, but that should be, we're hoping to get that out at the end of October. So I'll definitely uh, share that with the group. 
um, when we're done. And that just kind of is a bigger, deeper dive to the water quality and the trends and um, in the Milwaukee Basin. And we use data from Riverkeeper volunteers and then also from all of our partners at MSD and DNR and Ozaki County and, and some of the other uh, NGOs that monitor. So I think with that, I'm not going to, I'll just leave here you with my, my phone number and also my email, which I apologize for, it's like the longest email ever. But if anyone has any follow-up questions, um, feel, you know, feel free to send me a line or um, you know, give me a call and I'd be happy to answer any questions that anyone might have. Great, thank you so much, Cheryl, for all of that fabulous information. Um, we'd like to go ahead and open it up for questions. Feel free to unmute yourself and, um, and ask your questions out loud. You can also type them in the chat if you want, however you prefer to direct your questions to Cheryl. Okay. I'll just sleep. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> I'll start by saying that the work on places like Pulaski Park, walking by there, it's really impressive to see what they've done there and you know all the improvements on, on the KK. Um, do you want to address a little this whole part about what they're going to do with the sludge and putting yeah. it on the lakefront? Yeah, I can do that. So um, I should have put a slide in about that too. I apologize for that. But so I think some folks are familiar with the existing confined disposal facility, right? Which is the, it's the area where a lot, no, maybe not. So there, there's an area now when there's navigational dredging done. Um, a lot of that sediment, that's actually done a lot by the Army Corps of Engineers. And that sediment's taken to a facility that's called the confined disposal facility, um, which is on the lakefront directly north of like where the um, Lake Express terminal is. Um, in the Port of Milwaukee. So it's not an area that, if you haven't taken the Lake Express, you might not even really be familiar with it, but it is, it, it, that area that the existing facility is largely full. I think it's about 80% full at this point. Um, and it really, you know, looks visually, uh, a lot of it right now as like kind of a wetland. They actually used to let us get out there and look for ducks and, and birds and owls and things. And now it's all kind of fenced off, unfortunately. Um, but that area, um, some of the sediment from this project will functionally go into that existing facility. Um, you know, and it, that is a federal facility. It's, it was, it's funded largely with federal money also, but different federal money. So um, what will happen is that that facility will be used, I think, in the short term. Um, they're looking to build an additional facility um, just to the north of that facility. So that's being called the Dredge Material Management Facility. And they have horrible acronyms for all this stuff. But um, Essentially, it's very similar to the CDF in that they're going to be creating like an outline with steel, and it's a little bit more complicated than that, but they will essentially be filling that area in kind of like a layer cake with some of these sediments until it fills up to the top. And there, were, there, are, there, are, there is monitoring, there's leachate systems that are put in kind of similar to like a landfill, um, and then all of the, that sediment that'll be kind of wet sludgy stuff will dry out and the leachate will be actually piped to a treatment plant that has to be constructed. Um, and so the, and a lot of those details are unknown, like to what level they're gonna treat it. Um, and we'll clearly be advocating that they're treating it to a very high level. We're also, we already have kind of thrown some lines in the sand that they should be treating for PFAS, even though we don't have any state or federal regulations. I think DNR kind of, their answer is that, well, they don't feel like they can, you know, require them to clean up things that we don't have standards for, but I think it's pretty clear that we're going to have standards for those things, you know, in the next five years. Um, and we know that the stuff is in the sediments as well. So we want to make sure we're not, you know, we're cleaning up for everything that could be in that. So that's the, the, the preferred alternative right now would be building this new facility. They do have to physically move a combined sewer overflow that goes into the lake at that location which would essentially just go north of the, it's looking like they're, they're proposing it will just go north of the new facility that they're, they're um, putting in there. The other option that they looked at was trucking this stuff to Orchard Ridge Landfill, which is in Menominee Falls. And some folks are familiar with that, which is a whole other, there's a whole other scandal <laughs> at Orchard Ridge right now. Um, but they are, they would be basically, there would be around 200,000 truckloads of, of dirt 
that they'd have to send um, to that landfill. It also, if, if folks have seen the cleanup that happened in Cedarburg or even the cleanup that happened in Sheboygan, they have to create these giant bags that they fill in with the sludge. And then they literally hire people to like walk on them with rakes and sticks and beat them so the water comes out. And then they have to treat the water, dry the sediment out, and then take that dried sediment to the dump, you know, to the landfill. So it requires actually a really tremendous footprint in Cedarburg. They actually took a whole like 80 acre park was converted into these bags when we did the first phase of the PCB cleanup um, for Mercury Marine that just happened about two years ago. Um, it's they're incredibly large systems, and so that you know the the downside in my mind to is that there'd be huge trucking issues through neighborhoods. You know, huge uh, facilities would have to be created for this stuff. And it's also, you know, like would be, I think another, I can't remember the cost, but it's like significantly more expensive to take stuff to Orchard Ridge. Um, with a lot of the hydraulic dredging that's done now, um, and if folks saw what was happening in Sheboygan, they are doing this stuff now instead of with the big clamshells, right? The, the big machines that like we use at Lincoln Park, they use these things, they look like vacuum cleaners with huge tubes and they literally precision suck this stuff up. And um, they're saying that they can, they will be able to suck it up into this vacuum cleaner and then that the end of the vacuum will go right to this uh, new facility that they're building. They also are saying that they think they might be able to sink those so you wouldn't even visually, visibly see them. Um, and so that would mean that there, there'd be less, uh, you know, they wouldn't have to shut the river down necessarily for boating and things, which is another thing that uh, a lot of us are concerned about. Um, so we're looking at it, I guess that would be, you know, about, several miles of, of tube would have to be put in place. They, we were told that as part of the Fox River project, they had up to 25 miles of some of those hydraulic uh, tubes going on. So they, some of those tubes were 25 miles long. Isn't that crazy to think about? So I was thinking like, wow, like that's a really long distance from the Milwaukee River. And the guys kind of laughed at me and were like, oh, up on the Fox, we had like 25 miles of, of pipe on some of these things. So, you know, that, I mean, there definitely are pros and cons. I think. One of the big things that we've been saying is if they are going to be filling in what essentially is a public resource, um, which is Lake Michigan, uh, then they need to assure, ensure that whatever, you know, this area as well as the CDF when it's complete will become like a park, you know, and I think ideally it will be like a wetland, potentially boardwalky. I would love to see it as like a park, you know, bird watching area. The upper like kind of layer of that could be designed to be more kind of wetland habitat. Um, and so I, I think, and that's kind of what the existing facility is basically trying to become on its own. So I think that would be the best case scenario. But, you know, to be completely honest, the port keeps committing to like a public use. Um, but when they say public, you know, I think in their mind, and Ann and Eric will be familiar with this, I think, you know, they're thinking like, well, pub, you know, public use could be salt piles, could be, you know, big, rock piles could be God knows what, you know, whatever the port wants to put on there, they're calling public. It's a public use, right? Because it's it's serving the port. So we've said, well, that's all fine and good, but we don't want it to be like more, you know, area for more salt piles. We want whatever, if you're doing this thing to our resource, um, you know, for this purpose, which I think, you know, we'll have a, I will say that the, with the CDF option, you know, with that facility option, we'll be able to do a lot more cleaning. I think if we did do the, the landfill option, we would probably not be able to clean as much up because of just the huge cost differentials. So to me, I think it it, I, it is justified, I think, because I think we'll be able to do much more cleanup if we build this new facility. But we also are simultaneously really pushing, you know, really high level treatment and that this facility that's built, the end use is a part, you know, and making, but, you know, the, the port has been cagey about it. And then the city, you know, the city says like, well, Alderman will figure this out in 20 years when this project's all done and everything's done being monitored and everything's settled. And it's like, well, that's not good enough. You know, we can't trust the council today, let alone in 20 years. So it's like, I want legal language and easements and things on paper, you know. Again, not to say that things can't be changed because we know that happens too. But anyway, sorry, that was a very long answer to your question, Karen. I think Ann and Eric had a question too. Go ahead, you guys. 
Yeah, Cheryl, I was just wondering if you could list some of the uh, rock star residents of the river. I know that we had family of river otters down by Myad. I know the the camera at the fish passage in Thienesville has really got an amazing record of brook trout and other things. And I think we've also had redheaded woodpeckers mm -hmm. nesting. And I was wondering if there was any other uh, critter stories like that that you would want to share mm. just as a sign of the health of the habitat. Well, that's a great that's a great question. At first, I thought you meant humans, and I was like, oh, there's so many. Um, I think we have a lot of human rock stars as well. It's important to throw that out there. And one is there's a few on this call for sure. Um, I would say, um, you know, we we have river otters and we've, we've had them for a while, I would say mostly in the northern part of the basin. And obviously they're not very common. I will say though, they're becoming increasingly common, I'd say from Mequon up. Uh, and folks might have noted, remember a couple of years ago, there was some video of them even in downtown Milwaukee playing. Um, we documented one um, using like a little otter slide in downtown Malvatosa near the Hollander, which like got picked up by NPR and had like create like 2 million likes or something. Um, so, you know, the otters are, I think, exciting. Uh, you know, let's see what else. I mean, I think the sturgeon coming back is a really big deal. You know, some of these sturgeon, it takes, it could take them like anywhere. I guess the DNR biologists have said the women, the female sturgeon can start reproducing at 16, but it's more common that they reproduce starting at like age 20. Um, and we've started to see some of these sturgeon coming back up now that are around that 13, 14 year old age um, that were some of the very first ones that were stocked by DNR and River Edge. So it's a, that's really exciting, I think, news that we're starting to see some of those early recruits coming back um, and that they're actually coming back up our river. Um, we used to stock sturgeon from the Wolf River or the Fox River, and they were kind of showing up in Indiana and Michigan and kind of ticking off some of the other states. So they're being grown up at River Edge on, to imprint on Milwaukee River water, and they're coming back on the Milwaukee River, which is a big deal. Um, and so I think we're incredibly excited about that and, and hoping that that improves. Um, so, I mean, I guess those are kind of the big ones. I should say another, I don't know if it's, this is certainly not a sensitive species, but I have a funny story. So we were paddling, and I think a couple people know this, Karen probably knows, but we were paddling a couple weeks ago for a riverkeeper paddle up the Menominee, and we've been seeing a lot more beaver. And beaver, obviously, I love beaver, but a lot of people hate them. They're controversial. Even like some high, like I had a really high level biologist at DNR the other day call, like call beaver like a, I mean, he thinks they're vermin. I think he actually used the vermin word. So, um, you know, like some people don't love them. I think they're great engineers and habitat creators. And I like seeing them, but although they clearly cut people's trees down and, and irritate the, a lot of homeowners in the county parks. But I was wondering, you know, they're taking out all the trees along the Hank Aaron State Trail and the Lower Menominee, and they've taken out a couple trees in the third ward along the river walk, which has really ticked the river, river walk people off. So, but we were trying to figure out how they were getting back and forth from the water to the top of the seawall. And, you know, last year, the water was like way at the top of the seawall, right? Because the lake was about two feet higher. Um, so we had some areas where the rivers were like right there. So that was kind of like obvious, you know, what was happening, but this year, the lake's down about, you know, almost close to two feet now. So it's pretty hard for the, the beavers to get back and forth. And I was trying to figure out whether they were getting up on a log or if they were, you know, getting into the storm sewer somehow. Um, but we, the other day we were paddling and we literally saw like there's a family of three beavers swimming around the Lower Menominee, probably around um, close to Ember Lane. So like probably like 14th, 15th Street. And um, they used the, the safety ladder on the seawall. We saw this chubby beaver who I think looked like he was 65 pounds, like doop, 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 up the, up the little ladder on the seawall, like it was nothing. And we got it, we have it in video, we have a bunch of pictures, we were all really excited. But just shows you like how um, amazing wildlife can be, even like in downtown Milwaukee, it's pretty incredible. Other questions? Uh, I have a kind of a silly question. Um, I w was in uh, a presentation the other day where they were talking about the um, wild rice. And I know they're doing this um, restoration down in the Burnham Canal and on the Menominee and, and such mm -hmm. as there, <laughs> I don't suppose there's any chance they'd 
reintroduce some wild rice down there for old time's sake? That is a great, that's a great question. So I'm with you there. I, we actually did put some in, um, and if people are familiar, we put a canoe launch in at Ember Lane, which is like 13th street. Um, and it, there's a long story to that, but there's, there's a kind of a floating pipe there that's keeping the trash in the channel so the skimmer can get it. We had originally wanted to make that appear, but it was going to be like $3 million worth of seal. So anyway, in that corner, we did put some wild rice in there to try to see if it would grow um, kind of experimentally. And at the time, that, that was before we had those really high lake levels. So the, the I think wild rice needs like elevation that's kind of I'm and someone like kind of chime in if I'm totally wrong here, but I think it's like three to five feet or something of water. Um, and so we were pretty close to that when we seeded the wild rice in the corner. We were kind of hoping, like seeing whether or not it would take. Um, it didn't really take. And I think part of it is, you know, we might, you know, we, it, I think part of it is water quality. I think the other issue is because of the sage from the lake that, you know, the lake is kind of constantly slushing back and forth. The water levels might be fine like one day and then are like way high the next day. So I, I think on the main stem of the Menominee, it would be pretty rough to get wild rice going unless we could get them on like one of those floating islands. Um, and we had talked about that too, and that could still be a potential. I do think in the Burnham Canal, it actually might work um, because they could probably fill it in so that we could get that water level right for wild rice. The big question is the water quality and if the water quality would be good enough for it. That's a big question. The other thing I didn't mention is there are like two CSOs that discharge into Burnham Canal. So we're trying to get um, at the very westerly end. So we are in talks with MSD about whether they can reroute those CSOs somewhere else um, in, you know, to another part of the system or just back into the tunnel. My, my understanding is they don't discharge very often, um, but uh, that I think the big barrier to the wild rice reestablishing is probably the water quality, but I think it's worth trying because I, I think it would be fun. And I know the Potawatomi are very interested in, in seeing that happen as well. Thank you. Well, others are thinking of questions. Um, Cheryl, I just want to direct your attention to the chat real quick where Linda posted a very nice complimentary message. Yes to coffee, Linda, anytime. <laughs> and I know some people might need to pop off in a minute here. So um, we will make time for more questions. But before folks leave, I just wanted to let you know about our program next month. Our November program will also be held via Zoom. Unfortunately, we were hoping we could have it at um, one of the local libraries. But um, because of COVID considerations, it will once again be via Zoom. And um, Karen just popped the registration link into the chat. Thanks, Karen. So the topic will be building a multicultural and multiracial, multiracial environmental movement. And it's going to be led by Mandy McAllister from uh, Hummingbird MKE. We're really looking forward to that presentation. That's going to be at 6.30 on November 15th. Um, we hope you'll be able to join us for that. And uh Karen and David do you want to share any other events that we have coming up or things that nearby nature has coming up the chapter has their environmental justice series yeah. and uh I just put a link in there let me um so they've moved the next one it is now Thursday, October 28th at seven, that's coal, gas, and public health on the electric sector and environmental justice. November 3rd, uprooting racism, seeding sovereignty, virtual keynote featuring Leah and Naima Pennyman. Um, new date, November 11th, indigenous resistance to mining in Wisconsin, a panel discussion, and then a January one with Sierra Club leaders. Yeah, and I'll say they've had two in that series so far, and they've both been excellent. So highly recommend. Yeah, and the Emily Ford one, uh, they did video. They do have a, it was on Zoom, and they do have a recording, and we will make sure to post that on the Great Waters Facebook page as well. I, it, it's probably on the chapter page, but we'll get it on Great Waters because it was a, a fascinating presentation. This is the woman who uh, through hiked the um, Ice Age Trail in the winter. And uh, of course, half the questions were about the dog, but. 
um yeah I, i'm not nearly as prepared as karen with uh suggestions of things that are going on but um on wednesday evening uh the national sierra club is hosting a, a presentation uh by uh hop hopkins um he's the sierra club's director of organizational transformation and um and i i think uh, his writing um, for the Sierra Club and and his activity around uh, disrupting white supremacy is is pretty groundbreaking and um, and I'm looking for a link to that right now. If I can find it, I'll post it in the in the it. chat. David, I'll take. I got it for you. I'm posting it right now. Oh, thank you so much. And um, the, um, it's kind of strange. They have a you sign up for. Um, on the Sierra Club website, and then you have to click another link to uh, to register for the Zoom. So it's uh, it's a little tricky to to get connected, but um, but I encourage people to take a look at that. Um, <coughs> uh, Nearby Nature had a, a a color walk last weekend. It's it's really one of the last big public. Uh, events we had on the calendar and we had 30 people show up during the Packers game <laughs> is pretty good. And uh, um, Martina Patterson, who just finished her um, master naturalist program, uh, led the led the walk and and it was she really has an interesting perspective about plants and looking at things from the plants perspective and also uh, some uh, native medicinal uses for uh, for plants and things like that. Um, we are doing some trail building, um, but we're really kind of focusing on on getting folks from the neighborhood out to build this new trail along um, some MMSD property that the Sierra Club has adopted. Uh, if anybody wants to be involved in that, it's we've announced the dates on the. Uh, um, nearby nature newsletter that most of the people here are getting that. Um, and then we're launching into a whole series of uh, Lincoln Creek conversations that we're hoping will uh, lead into something uh, more long-term similar to the uh, Milwaukee River Greenway Coalition. But it's, it's really just kind of be, uh, at the beginning stages and, and conversation stage to uh, to bring out people's ideas and, and hopes and visions for uh, the Milwaukee River Greenway. I'm sorry, the Lincoln Creek Greenway. Um, and so we're kind of going into the winter, uh, hunkering down, doing some uh, small group discussions and things like that. And um, the springtime, uh, there'll be some more big public kinds of things going on. We should also point out that uh, Nearby Nature and Bright Waters Group have our official Adopter River partners with River Keeper on this stretch of Lincoln Creek that David was talking about. David, do we have a, our November, December cleanup scheduled? <laughs> I haven't seen it on the calendar. Uh, we do not. And you're the second person this week to ask me that question. So uh, um, my answer was, Oh, do we need to? <laughs> um, Don't say that with Cheryl listening. <laughs> well, yeah. I, mean, you know, you know, I think we're requiring at least like two per year, but I mean, I think, you know, you guys, I think have probably done well more than that. Yeah, I think we did three this past year and, and yeah. um, we did have Molson Coors came out and I was out there with them and we had hoped they were going to get from 51st to 43rd. And I think I would guesstimate we got to around 48th Street, maybe. But that, I think. Like Ali just sent another group down to the other section, I think another corporate group like from Baird, I think. So we're, we're trying to get you guys some extra help. <laughs> That's great that that those sections are in desperate need, but mm -hmm. um, we're going to be out there working uh, tomorrow doing the first. Uh, during the first shovels for this new trail and um, we'll uh, talk about it. Uh, one thing is, is that usually when we plan a uh, a cleanup in November or December, it's usually a guarantee that snow will 
come. So I'm a little bit hesitant in that respect. I don't want to encourage it. But stay tuned. But just if there's anyone new out there to be aware that um, Riverkeeper has a big cleanup in the spring that uh, Sierra Club members are always participating in and you can find one closer to your own neighborhood if you want. Yeah, and it's already scheduled, I think. Uh, oof, I don't think I have it on my calendar, but it's the, it's the 23rd, I think, which is the Saturday after Earth Day. Okay. All right. Other questions for Cheryl? Yeah, and as, that's all. That's cool. And I just say, you know, feel yeah, feel free to email me or call me. Uh, I'll throw my email again in the chat here if anyone has any other questions. I'm highly Googleable too. And she always posts cool pictures on Facebook. I do, yeah. Follow me on all of the social things. Well, I should say Riverkeeper too. But I should say too, there are there's going to be um, three or four, I think, different. I don't think I don't know if we're calling them. They're not really public hearings, but public meetings on a bunch of the Milwaukee River work that's going to start happening. I think in November. Um, and I was hoping that I would have that flyer to share for this, but they. I think we should have it by the end of the week. Um, and we're going to have some office hours too, which I need to talk to Dave about because I think we're going to try to have some, we're calling office hours, but we're going to try to have some at Lincoln Park and Estabrook Park where we have some, I'll probably be there for both and we'll have some engineers and other people and we're just going to like hang if people want tours or have questions, just trying to find other ways to get people kind of aware of the, all the projects that are happening. So um, you can find out more if you follow us on, on social media, we'll be posting all that stuff through that. Um, at Riverkeeper, but there's also um, that Waterway Restoration Partners website. Um, we'll hopefully be keeping that up to date too. But if you're already like on our Riverkeeper news, you'll, you'll find about it from us. Thank you, Cheryl. Yeah, thanks. My pleasure. Lovely to see all of you. Hopefully we'll see you in person next time. The Zoom is getting old. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much, everyone, for tuning in. Hey, Linda. Oh, I love your back, your, your wonderful Milwaukee River background. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jenny, um, don't forget to uh, tell Cheryl what she's getting. <gasps> oh. Oh my, oh, my goodness. That's right. So, um, Cheryl, well, Bill may have told you this already, but we have a gift membership for you for the Sierra Club and a walking stick that Bill will be delivering to you at some point, a personalized one with your name on it. I'm so excited. <laughs> Made by our own Ed Anderson, who was a very active member of our Volunteer Leadership Council for a long, long time. And um, makes the the walking sticks from reclaimed wood as a hobby so um, we're really glad that we'll be able to yeah uh, thank you so much I love that yeah. I have one other one I have to say and it's leaning on and I can see it from here it's like leaning against my wall oh so now I'll have two I can use them like ski poles <laughs> yeah, yeah, poles. yeah. <laughs> yeah thanks Karen for um I love it reminding me about that yeah yeah so we we so appreciate you taking the time tonight this was incredibly informative yeah. thanks so much you guys Bye. good night have a good night. good night thank you thanks everybody okay all right <sighs> Oh, 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 I gotta stop the recording. There we go. Wait.